Our next presenter is Justin Guerra. <laughs> After being honorably discharged from the USMC in 2015, Justin completed a degree in geography and environmental sustainability at UT San Antonio in 2019, where he concentrated in GIS applications. He then was employed by the city of Galveston's municipal utility department as a GIS field technician, eventually spearheading the wastewater collection Division's proactive maintenance program as the municipal utility program and maintenance <laughs> supervisor. During this time, Justin and a colleague pu published a peer review article highlighting the urban encroachment of the Edwards Aquifer using land cover data and GIS and analytics. Justin now offers his experience to the members of TRWA as a GIS and drone technician. Please welcome Justin Guerra. All right, all right, all right, all right. Thank you, folks, thank you. All right, let me work this mic right here now. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into this session. What is GIS? That's the grand question that we're all asking ourselves today. Well, Esri kind of explains it pretty well. A uh, geographic information system is a system that creates, manages, analyzes, and maps all types of data, all right? And you, pretty much you're utilizing GIS on a daily basis. Like how I explained to my mother, what I do for a living is I basically do Google Maps, all right? Just on the water and wastewater side. So that layman's terms helps her out a lot. But again, it's pretty much utilized in almost any industry, anything that uh, contains any kind of uh, spatial component to it and um, any kind of descriptive um, information that you would like to attach to it. Um, GIS connects data to map, integrating location data with all types of descriptive information, uh, commonly referred to as uh, attributes. Um, this provides the uh, foundation for mapping and analysis that is used in science in almost every day. So just to give you an example, here we have different uh, data sets. Um, once you compile it together, this is where that system component comes into play. You start seeing how all these other um, assets and components start integrating, not only with your infrastructure, but with maybe other infrastructures or maybe other um, aspects in the real world. So what are the different components of GIS? You have your hardware, which can be your desktop, um, your uh, smart devices or your GNSS receiver. And you also have your software, which uh, could be your GIS platform, um, licensing extensions of different applications. Um, you also have data, and that could be either geographic or have that spatial component that I mentioned. Um, your tabular data or your metadata. Another one would be the people. Who is actually running the GIS? That could be your field, uh, field technicians that are doing the field surveying. Um, it could be analysts that once they receive that data, then they can see how all that is integrated together. And then you have your managers and so on and so forth. And this might differ depending on the size of that utility. I know municipalities tend to have like an IT department where their GIS is housed. And then you have some uh, water industries that Again, for their public utilities, they already have a GIS technician for them. So it kind of helps bridge that. And then you also have your uh, methods, which would be your SOPs. How do you go about collecting your information? Um, models, you can do model builders, that uh, model builder uh, application that would help uh, see projections and whatnot, and your workflows. So what are the different types of GIS data? Well, we're gonna go ahead and break it down to two. You have your vector and your raster. Your vector is pretty much your basic um, GIS data. It's your points, lines, and polygons. Um, raster is a little bit more complicated just in the sense that it's continuous data. That means it's not fixated. Uh, to give you an example would be, say, temperature. Temperature is never fixated, it's always constantly changing. So raster is the best of, uh, type of GIS data to illustrate that or such as elevation and whatnot. So you have your different GIS file formats. So your basics is your shape files. And those are comprised of your uh, shape file itself, 
Um, you also have your database, your uh, geographic uh, projection, and then that could all be housed into a geo uh, database that basically houses all those layers and components into it. Um, different GIS software have also uh, file formats such as um, Esri, they do have the MXD uh, that probably, uh, houses all your symbology and whatnot. And then you also have your KML, KMZ, that's what you typically uh, get from Google Earth. Uh, whenever you're dealing with Google Earth and you're exporting your files, that is a GIS format in itself. And then you have your CAD or your computer automated designs. Um, how I usually explain to folks is it's, it, CAD is more like a schematic. It will tell you all your components um, that are comprised in that infrastructure or your distribution system. Um, but it won't have that great spatial context in it. Um, or say your tabular data, it, it, it probably won't be able to house that. They pretty much rely on labeling their, their, their features. Um, so some sources of inaccuracy, you have scale. Um, a lot of time when I'm dealing with uh, utilities, uh, digitizing their uh, as-builds, uh, they'll hand me, uh, you know, at a certain extent. And again, I'm, as I'm translating that onto GIS, there's gonna be that room for inaccuracy. Hey, maybe, uh, the as-built shows it that it's on the right side of the road when in actuality it's on the left side of the road. All right, that could be a, a common uh, inaccuracy. Um, another is age of data. Um, I remember when I started off with the city of Galveston, they kind of shrugged off and they're like, hey, well, we already did GIS back in 03. Why do we need a guy now? Well, that's back in 03. Uh, a lot has changed since then, particularly with the city of Galveston with all the hurricanes that they have experienced and whatnot. So age of data is one source of inaccuracy. Um, you also have your formatting. Um, that's from anywhere from changes in scales, um, reprojections, uh, and um, import and export of raster data, and vector data, and whatnot. And then you also have your quantitative and qualitative errors. Um, I usually chop that up as operator error. <laughs> Maybe, uh, he, you know, Schmuckatelli over there was in a bad mood and he didn't put in, input all the right, correct data at that time. But it could also be, say, your equipment. Hey, if you happen to drop your GNSS receiver, well, that's gonna give you some kind of quantitative error in there. All right, and then what can GIS um, do for you? All right, um, one big thing is asset management. And the one thing to start off with is, what assets do you have? And that's a big question for some of our utilities here. Uh, what is actually yours? What is a neighboring system? Or has that actually been um, taken out of your infrastructure? So one is just knowing what assets you actually do have. The other one is, where is it located? All right. Um, a lot of times what we're seeing now, uh, especially, uh, especially now with our aging workforce that they're now retiring, they're taking a lot of that wealth of knowledge with them, all the locations of those water meters, those valves and whatnot. So what GIS can help you or uh, in, in the asset management portion is knowing where they're located. And then again, once you know where they're at, what condition are they in? Is it still serviceable? Can I still turn that valve? All right, does it lock or anything like that? Does that meter still uh, 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 properly work? Is there any kind of leakage that you're seeing there? Just knowing the overall condition and being able to put that onto a map, throw in some symbology on that can give you a good understanding of, hey, maybe my system needs a little bit of capital improvement. And then lastly, there you go. Is it in need of repair or replacement? All right, and that's what GIS can help you streamline as you're going. You're going out there in the field collecting, then you're doing your condition assessments, analyzing what needs to be uh, repaired and replaced, and then doing your cost analysis on that. Here's an example that I did out here in South Texas. Um, as you can see, I have my descriptive data. I know that that valve that I selected is a blow off or a flush valve. I know it's on a two inch. It's a square nut, it's on the right of way and it happens to be in their zone three. Another thing is my condition assessment on it. Is the, does it have a uh, valve lid on it? 
um, is, oh, can't see it here, um, is it serviceable and, and whatnot, and then you can also track in your uh, GPS information, collecting that, storing that, being able to know, hey, where is it actually in lat and longitude? I know engineers love to have this kind of data. And you could go in there and start messing around with some of that symbology. This is an example of a sewer system, and we're putting in the direction of flow for that sewer. That can be helpful, say, if you need to plug in that, that manhole because you're doing a repair on the line, you could start seeing, hey, down the stream, this is who's, who's going to be affected, or up the stream, this is who's going to be affected. Uh, prepare yourself for possible SSOs or whatnot. And then I love this component, uh, attaching your photos. It's one thing showing it on a map. It's better when you can actually show it when it's in real life. So say if you're um, installing a water line extension and you have your GNS receiver, go ahead and trace that line before um, they start doing the backfill. That way you know the exact location of that line and you could take that photo and attach it and verify that. It also can help with your lead service line inventory. Um, a lot of GIS softwares already have that built-in um, uh, fields um, for the questions such as for through uh, EPA or TCEQ, and you're allowed to export that out in their format. I know TCEQ has it in an Excel format. A lot of GIS software will allow you to spit out that information as such. But again, you're able to collect all this out in the field using your GIS software. Next comes, like I led to, your capital improvements. Once you know where your assets are at, and what condition they're in, and if they need any replacements, that's where you could start making that argument, hey, we're starting to get more um, uh, population in our area, and uh, we're going to need more lines. We're going to need larger lines or such a forth. Or you could start picking up your trouble areas. Um, here's an example that I did in the city of Galveston. Um, combined with uh, InfoSense's uh, SLRAT or sewer line rapid assessment test, what that did it was I was able to put a transmitter on one manhole and then a receiver on the other and detect the blockage of that sewer line. And the great thing about that equipment is that it allowed me to export it out as a shape file. And I attached that to my GIS software and then changed with the symbology there. Hey, everything that's good, green. Everything that's fair, yellow, poor, red, and then completely blocked, black. And you're looking right here, and you, at first glance, you're thinking, oh, my God, this, this area needs help, right? Um, what you can't really see, I think I have a red, yep, clicker right here. So I have a pentagon right here. It kind of blends in with the circle. But that pentagon symbolizes the lift station. And as you notice, all my blockages tend to lead up to that lift station. At first, my director wanted to rip out all the sewer lines. We got put in new sewer lines. They didn't even know there was two sewer lines on each side of the road. I told him, well, hold on, boss. I see something going on with that lift station. Let's kind of go check it out. Let's see oh, what's the issue there. We have end up finding out an electrical component went out. And that's why it wasn't pumping out the sewage as it's supposed to and it was creating all these uh, blockages. So what costs, you know, a couple of hundred dollars, you know, electrical component, maybe in the a little bit in the thousands, saved us from going into a multi-million dollar project just by being able to collect all this data and then displaying it on a map. And this helps uh, board members or city management get a better uh, understanding of what's going on. Um, here's another example. Um, so again, I was out there GPSing uh, sewer manholes and I thought, hey, I'm already touching every asset. I'm, it wouldn't hurt to open it up and give it a condition assessment. So what you're seeing is every point there is a manhole with its ID uh, labeled out. And everything that passed, obviously green. Um, everything that failed, red. Purples were the ones that uh, could not access for whatever reason. Maybe, hey, somebody parked the vehicle on top of that manhole. Or in this case, I believe in this manhole, they actually paved over the manhole. All right, it showed it in our historicals. We couldn't find it in real life. We end up CCTVing and we found it under his driveway. That's another fight for another day, but that was something that GIS was able to uh, display. 
Um, and then all, everything that was orange was everything that I could not locate. Again, um, I was using historical maps as I was building these. And when I would ever come across, hey, there's supposed, there ought to be a manhole here, but I'm not finding it. I'm probing around. I'm using a metal detector, can't find it. I'll mark it as cannot locate, come back with the CCTV and verify the location of it. But at least this gives our, uh, the system um, a way of focusing on their rehabilitation for their manholes and what needs to be cleaned out. Uh, this was some of the data that I was collecting. Uh, this was very manual. <laughs> As you can see, it's on an Excel. I know Esri has a, a nice dashboard um, application which can display this a lot neater. But again, as you can see right here, I have on the far left side the uh, sewer shed that was in question, Terramar. And then I broke it up into um, all these sections. That way it was easier to do uh, monthly reports and whatnot. And then I would uh, track the amount of feet that I surveyed using the SLRAT and then what came out as a blockage. And then put that as a percentage and that way I can tell my director, hey, maybe we don't need to worry so much in section 147, but if you just go up on 146, it's 61% blocked. Maybe we, need to, got, maybe we need to go out there and line clean that and televise it, see what's the issue. Is it fog, fats, oils, or grease? Is it roots? Is it I and I? You know, it opens that can of worms to kind of investigate. And then going all forth, uh, these were the amount of manholes that were inspected, the ones that passed, that are in fair condition, and then that were poor. And then on the far right side, you're seeing how that came out as monthly reports. Oh, cut it off, no. So on this slide, um, it was also for updating CCNs. Uh, one thing that I've uh, come across as of lately when I'm out there GPSing for uh, water utilities is that they have a lot of connections outside their CCN. And that could be up for, you know, encroachment by another system or whatnot. So this, uh, by having a GIS, knowing where your CCN boundaries and then knowing where your connections are at can help you under, uh, uh, implement or um, expand your CCN and going through that process. And I know Public Utility Commission has a session uh, tomorrow that might go into further detail on, on, on the procedures on that. But GIS does help great, greatly in that aspect. And then your accuracy. So you hear a lot of folks say, hey, GPS unit and all that. Well, GPS is actually a constellation. It's not, it's not your unit or whatnot. It, what your unit is, is actually a global navigation satellite system or GNSS. GPS happens to be the US constellation, in which you see right here, we have 31 satellites orbiting. And then you have your GLONASS, which is your um, Russia. Galileo, the European, I'm gonna butcher this, Beidou uh, for China. And then I believe India is gonna be implementing also their own constellation soon. So all these satellites are orbiting around um, Earth and they, they uh, improve your accuracy or your GNSS accuracy up to sub-centimeter. And then that, that goes down to what level of GNS receiver do you have? Is it sub-survey grade? Is it sub-meters, sub-foot, so on and so forth? Um, and just to give you an example here, um, so when we're talking about commercial grade here, uh, we're talking about your cell phone devices. Um, I come across a lot of utilities say, hey, we don't need you to GPS, we did it already. And then that's where I ask, oh, okay, what GNSS receiver you use? Oh, we used our smartphones. Well, your smartphones, uh, they're within 12 to 16 feet of accuracy. And what happens when you're doing excavation and you're 16 feet off? Exactly. And then you got here your submeter category that's uh, probably within half a foot to three feet of accuracy. And then you got your decimeter grade or your subfoot. And that's where you're probably within four inches. And then you have survey grade that would be right on the money. And just to give you an example of the, the difference in power. So like how I mentioned, I had systems that said, hey, we did it with our cell phones. Should be accurate, right? Hey, that's showing a point in the driveway. There's supposed to be a water meter. 
You all see a water meter there? No. That water meter was actually on this side of the tree. All right? That can, again, this is a great display of showing, hey, your cell phones, as great as they are, they're not as accurate as they ought to be. Um, here's another reference. Again, what you're seeing here in the lime green was the uh, historical uh, GIS that G the city of Galveston had. And then these color-coded from the SL rat was what I actually went out there and I GPSed. How upset Mrs. Smith would be if you tore up all her rose bushes on the left side just to tell her, hey, it was actually on the right side. I got to mess up your daffodils. Good luck fighting that fight. Here's another example. Um, on this one, we were having complaints. Uh, one, that a power pole was kind of leaning in over towards the resident side. Um, when I went back there and started looking at the SL rat that I collected and put it onto GIS, I noticed that I was having a lot of blockages, particularly in that area where that power pole was. So I saw a lot of subsidence. So I went ahead and called the electrical comp uh, company and told them, hey, you drove a power pole through our sewer line. Oh, okay, that's neat. Prove it. I was like, oh, okay. I thought you were going to help me out here. <laughs> but um, I tried to see, um, televise it, couldn't. It was just sucking in so much dirt. Um, no matter how much I line clean, it, it was just bringing in so much dirt. But um, fortunately, when I was with the city of Galveston, we had a sub-inch uh, GNSS receiver. And when I marked this point, it was, I believe, 0.3 inches off. And then this point uh, was a uh, 0.4 inches off. And then it's a gravity fed line. And when I put that on top of our aerial that we paid for, that power pole is this black line that you're seeing right here. That's the shadow smacked on my line. Here's my proof of burden. Go fix yourself. <laughs> and I, I would place bets on other operators when they'll tell me, hey, we don't trust your, the accuracy of your of, a, of your GPS unit and whatnot. Okay, bet your paycheck on that because I'm very confident in the accuracy of what that I put. Just to give you one scenario, they had me out there GPS a valve, did it. Three days later, streets came over and paved right over it. Uh, the supervisor was losing it. He was like, uh, didn't you just GPS it a couple of days ago? I need you to go find it. Use the field maps on with Esri, followed exactly to that point, Knew it's about four inches in diameter, spray paint it. They came back and they're all, it was right on the money. They literally hit the lid of the valve. So again, accuracy is really great in, 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 in our line of business, knowing exactly where our line's at, where our assets uh, line up. So devices that utilizes GNS receivers, pretty much your smart devices. And uh, most uh, GNS receivers now in the market, um, they're compatible with your smart devices. I remember back in the day, it was mainly uh, Androids that were very compatible. Uh, but as of lately, I believe uh, Apple has got into the game as well. So their devices are also compatible with a lot of the GNSS receivers that are out there. And they... Uh, Again, with the GNS uh, receivers, you know, you have access to a greater number of satellites that improve your accuracy. Um, and it gives you also correction sources. So one of the correction sources is your free public one, SBAS, or uh, satellite base augmentation satellites or systems. Sorry, missing the last S, but um, that's your free public uh, correction service. And then you also have RTK or real-time kinetic uh, uh, correction. And what that basically does is, so your SBAS is coming from these satellites to your GNS receiver. That's where your receiver starts putting in the algorithm, making those corrections and whatnot. And then it outlays it onto your device. What RTK does is that it goes from a satellite to a tower, which amplifies and gets you a better correction source on that. And then, um, let's see, and then again, antennas actually um, also help amp amplify the accuracy of your GNSS receivers. Another one is data gathering. And this one doesn't show all the slides. 
Okay, so one component um, that I like with GIS is that either some uh, softwares have a built-in work order system um, already in them. Um, so uh, again, whenever you're doing a meter uh, replacement and whatnot, that work order will be attached to that asset. So it's no longer having to go through the filing cabinet from the Library of Alexandria trying to find out what work orders were done on it. But now you could just click on the asset, see the historical work orders on it, and then go on from there. Um, you can also plan out uh, schedules, reoccurring uh, work orders, um, such as, hey, I need to do my lead sampling or I need to do my uh, water pump inspections and whatnot. You can have those uh, reoccurring uh, work orders uh, in place and get the notification to that operator themselves. Um, usually you attach the username, um, an email, and they'll get those notification. Hey, you have a, a work order uh, assigned to you and they'll just open up their GIS app, uh, GIS app and see all that from the field. And here's a an example of that work order. So you could go as far as putting in plans, started, completed, and approved, what type of work order it was, the description, the work performed, anybody that was assigned to it, and then all your photo attachments, your before, your after, any kind of ins uh, inspection reports, so your CSIs can be attached to there. Uh, recently, I told systems, hey, if you have uh, your water tank inspections, you can attach that onto your GIS. That way, again, you're not going through all these files and folders trying to find it. You would just be easy as clicking on that asset. And then you could have your assignees and then what kind of work orders you have here. I'm good. I, I'm going to leave it open for Q&A if anybody has questions. Oh, we got one in the back. Yes. You mentioned that the... You had the uh, work order software. Is that a GIS software or is that something like Cartograph or some other uh, you know, attachment? Okay, uh, the one that I just showed you was one that was already built into the GIS software. So I, I, when you create a new layer, it already has that work order. But there's also uh, what you can set up is an API. So if you have a different uh, work order system, um, a, a lot of the GIS software could use that interface between your work order system and your GIS mapping. Do all GISs have that functionality, work order, or do you have to the, buy Esri or something? It would be d depending on what GIS software you're using. Um, I know Esri uh, with the ArcGIS, they have their own uh, work order system. I, I forgot the name off the top of my head. Um, but the example that I just showed you was from uh, Diamond Maps. They had theirs already built into it uh, for that. I know for Esri, you would have to uh, do a little bit of, uh, not manipulation, but setting it up, your work order system. Uh, that way it's built into your GIS mapping. Any other questions? Come on, shoot, hit me. Few, I'm ready. There's a few questions from the virtual audience. Oh, okay. Uh, when would you recommend a utility to get a drone and for what use? To get to a drone, okay. Um, I would say it would be best if you already have your um, infrastructure mapped out uh, first. That way, say if you're using the drone um, for say leak detection, at least you could pick up the problem area. Uh, select the uh, mains that might be in question. You can export that out as a KML, KMZ. I know most drones uh, take that kind of uh, file format. And then that way your drone can actually go on autopilot and fly on that where that water main is on its own. So it would behoove if you're gonna go down towards using drones uh, for your daily operation, it will behoove to have your GIS set up prior. One more. A uh, GIS software is very useful but expensive, prohibitively expensive for smaller utilities. Do you know of any funding programs for smaller water utilities? Yes, as of right now, I know the Texas Water Board, uh, develop, uh, Texas Water uh, Development Board does have um, grants and funding out there for uh, utilities that are facing that challenge with GIS software. And I know uh, off the top that GIS software, especially the Cadillac, um, you know, Esri, they tend to be more on the expensive side, but there's also other alternatives. There's free sourcing 
Like again, Google Earth is, is a GIS software. It's free for, for anybody to use. But again, you're always gonna have those limitations on what data can be actually inputted, how it can be manipulated, what geo uh, processing tools are available for them. So there are alternatives. Uh, ArcGIS isn't the only GIS software out there. You have QGIS, I mentioned earlier, Diamond Maps. Um, I use Diamond Maps for my smaller system because it's a lot more user friendly. Um, you know, they don't, have, they don't need to have somebody that um, is in depth uh, knowledgeable into GIS, they're able to still just plot the points and draw the lines. So, to answer that question. Yes, er earlier you said under sources of inaccuracy where scale could be off, like red lines don't match reality. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you correct that? What do you do to go fix that? One, uh, what I've been primarily doing is uh, going off of the word of the operator. Um, what made my position as a field technician very um, equipped for is that not only did I know the technical side of the GIS uh, you know, platform, but I, wasn't, I was also not afraid to get my hands dirty. So I would always partner up with the operators and I'll tell them, give me all your, your dirty secrets, your skeletons, that way I can plot that onto the map and better serve you. Uh, one thing that my professor um, always kind of emphasized a lot was to uh, understand your audience. Um, you could draw the Mona Lisa of GIS maps, but if your audience is lost, they can't uh, maneuver behind it, then you failed as a GIS personnel. So again, um, I lean a lot towards operators. Um, there's other equipment out there now that can uh, better help you. Uh, I know there's a GPRs or ground penetrating radars. Kind of looks like a lawnmower and you're pushing through and it'll tell you um, so somewhat the classification of that pipe if you're coming across a best of cement or PVC. And what I tell you, uh, so, uh, some utilities, if you could get a GNSS receiver that is sub inch, you can attach that onto the GPR or the ground penetrating radar. So as you're finding your lines, you're GPSing at the same time. And it's in sub inch accuracy. So. I know like with say your water meters, you could leave it up with a couple, maybe you know, half a foot, maybe two feet off, but your water lines, you really wanna know where those are at. Come on, I like these questions. Keep, hit, keep rolling them out. I've got two more from the virtual audience. Why do you prefer ESRI over other GIS software? And do you know of any drone companies in Texas that provide moisture scanning services? Okay, for with that, ESRI, E-S-R-I, um, it's, it's probably one of the most preferred just because of the uh, analytical power that it has. It houses a lot of geoprocessing tools that unfortunately some GIS software do not maintain. Um, you know, just simple as just the clip function, some GIS software doesn't have that and it's very useful in the sense, especially like say if you're doing your CCN, I use clipping all the time. And that one's a, uh, not exclusive, but it, I, I've noticed that that's only on the Esri platform. So that's where, you know, when you're getting more analytical or more detail-oriented in your map, you know, Esri would probably be your best route to go. Yeah. So the GNS receiver, is that like a separate component that you buy? And can you use that with your yes. app application, like we have your Esri application on your phone? Okay, um, so basically um, the GNS receiver would be a separate component. It's a separate hardware. So what you would do is um, with your smart device, um, with your uh, tablet or whatnot, you would download first their, their applications. So like say Tremble or EOS, they will have their own application for it. Um, download that as well as having the, the hardware. And then it would be, I think the majority of them are Bluetooth synced. So you would sync your Bluetooth um, uh, smart device with the GNSS receiver. And then just depending on uh, what GNSS receiver, there are some that just interface automatically. You don't have to do any background uh, manipulation in the settings. Um, I noticed that um, with like say when I'm using EOS, um, I have to set up a mock location. Um, that's a little bit more background when you're using the settings in your own smart devices. So yes, the GNSS receiver is a separate hardware and then even there you got more hardware for your GNS receiver. You have your antenna, um, depending on how you want to carry it. 
Uh, when I started off with TRWA, they had me use a handheld uh, a carrier for the GNS receiver. I didn't like it because it, it, it restrained in my hands. Again, I'm out on top of every asset. I'm popping open manholes with a pickaxe or with a, with a turn stop. Um, so I like my hands free. So I get, I get, a, I get a, a chest pack carrier for it. So my GNS would be on my side. I have my antenna on my back. And then on the front pouch, I have my smart device. And it gives me that ability to have my hands free. Yeah, so you, what it'll be doing, it'll, your GNS uh, receiver connects to your smart device, which is already connected to your GIS software, uh, g given whatever platform you're on. So for Esri, I believe it's Field Maps, unless they change the name again. It's still Field Maps, okay, because they're, they're always constantly coming out with a new one. <laughs> um, they just approved it. Yeah, so they'll have their own uh, application for that, and it's basically interfacing with all three components. Uh, do you know of any drone companies in Texas that provide moisture scanning services? Uh, I'm guessing for leak detection. Uh, yes, uh, there is TRWA. I'm the drone operator that does that. <laughs> um, also, Samco, they do it. Um, the, I would say the issue with it as of right now is just isolating uh, the actual leak detect. Uh, detection portion of it um, because you have some G uh, drones that have uh, built-in infrared on their cameras and again you're probably roughly about 100 feet above the ground and you might misconstrue what is a water leak for the tree giving off shade and whatnot so again that it leaves you a little room for inaccuracy but it is beneficial but so say if you do come across a cool spot right um, a lot of the drones geotag their photos. So if you snip that spot uh, using your infrared or, your, or the HD uh, uh, camera that it has, it will geotag that photo. So then you can export your photo and import it into your GIS mapping. And that way, instead of walking two miles trying to find this water leak, you would have points where you detected or suspected the water leaks, and you can go forward there. And that's how I usually tell systems, use the drone for the um, aerial, that way you kind of isolate that, and then go further, use the acoustic leak detection. And again, that way you're, you're isolated, you know where the, uh, where the leak is possible, and you're not having to walk a mile or two trying to find, find that leak. Any other questions? Going once, going twice, sold. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. You all have a very blessed day.